of the Atal sponsored faculty development program titled Inno Innovative Micro and Nanotechnologies and Fundamental Principles organized by the Department of Mechanical Engineering, Haldi Institute of Technology. Uh, at the outset, let us welcome today's uh, invited speaker, uh, Dr. Ranjan Ganguly. Before uh, he starts his expert lecture, uh, let us give a brief about uh, 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 Pro Professor Ganguly. Professor Ranjan Ganguly uh, is a professor in the Power Engineering Department of Jadapur University and has more than 25 years of teaching experience. He is also an adjunct professor at the Mechanical and Industrial Engineering Department of University of Illinois at Chicago. Professor Ganguly completed a BE in Power Plant Engineering in 1995 and ME with Heat Power Specialization in 2000, both from Jadapur University. He received his PhD from University of Illinois at Chicago in 2005. He also had postdoctoral research stint at University at Hanover and TU Darmstadt, both in Germany, and Virginia Tech and University of Illinois at Chicago in USA. Professor Ganguly has received several accolades, including the Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship, the Indian National Academy of Engineering Young Engineer Award, BRNS Young Scientist Research Award, Dean Scholar Award, and Provost's Award for Graduate Research at University of Illinois at Chicago, and University Medals at Jadapur University two times. He is also a fellow of National Indian National Academy of Engineering and West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology. His primary research interest encompasses magnetic particle based microfluidics, weightability engineering, heat transfer and energy systems. Professor Ganguly has more than a thousand international journal publications, eight book chapters, five patents and two invention disclosures to his credit. Uh, his work is widely cited in different fields of engineering and research. We are proud to host uh, such an emin eminent personality as our invited speaker. So without further delay, uh, let us invite Professor Ganguly to deliver his expert question. Please, sir. Thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, uh, is my slide visible? Yes, this is visible. Okay, good. So thanks for the kind introduction. One small correction, like I don't have a thousand <coughs> publications. That's kind of like uh, enormous. It's probably, a, it's it's an order of magnitude less, which is 100. So <coughs> I uh, thank you very much uh, to Obhishek, uh, <coughs> Professor uh, Gautam Bose and all the colleagues at Haldia for inviting me for this program. And I'm really honored to share some of the research aspects in a tutorial manner to uh, a pool of faculty members as well as people from the industry. Some of the faculty members I already know, they are pretty senior and also renowned. So I'm really glad to interact with them and discuss some of the latest uh, facets of my research, which overlaps with the thematic area of this program and essentially discuss down the line. So this uh, program or this lecture is not going to be like a real continuous lecture. I would encourage that you ask questions, you stop me, you ask questions and we keep discussing as we unravel some of the features of this uh, fantastic phenomena of surface microfluidics, which I believe will be a game changer for designing future devices. So. As we all know, the top challenges that the world is facing today and even for the next 50 years is going to look something like this. We have energy crisis, water, there's shortage of food, environment, poverty, terrorism, diseases, education, democracy, and of course, population explosion. Today, we all know that the world population is going to cross uh, there's 8 billion mark. Nonetheless, out of this list, we all know that number seven, that is the diseases, has kind of plagued us for the last few years. 
for that COVID pandemic. Although in the past 10 or 20 years, we have seen remarkable growth in the global healthcare, which includes the progress in telemedicine, surgery with humanoid robots, personalized medicine, medication through genomic studies, uh, medical tricoders for instant portable diagnosis, wearable sensors, do-it-yourself biotechnology, 3D printing, so on and so forth. The global health still has some very meager figures. For example, nearly 30% do not have basic sanitation. It's a WHO report back in 2017. 17% do not have access to electricity. That's a pretty old figure, but it hasn't changed much. 18% lack basic healthcare services and clean drinking water. And more than 50% of the deaths in the poorest countries are the result of infectious disease. So while at one side we have seen enormous progress in the medical science, on the other hand, we see the global health scenario has really not progressed to a great extent and add to it the devastating pandemic. You can see the figures starting from March 1, 2020 till today with the spikes of infected and death. You can see the staggering number of total infection. Approximately one tenth, a little less than one tenth of the global population was infected. 6.6 million death, 66 lakhs. And all because we didn't have an affordable medication. Of course, we had some sort of medication, but number one, initially that was beyond the reach of common people and second there was not enough facility also so there was a real shortage or real dire necessity for low cost point of care diagnostic devices because the diagnosis of covid was at one point a huge bottleneck and how the diagnosis took place we used a technology which is or a, a, a common science in biotechnology which is known as immunoassay, which basically relies on the binding of antigen and antibody. This, there are some specific antigens, um, uh, or rather, some markers on the on the virus which can bind onto some specific antibody only and if they do so, we diagnose that particular uh, virus is present in the sample. And these testing kits were developed and there was a necessity for making these testing kits low in cost and also the sample actually i'll just show you the uh, maybe the basic of the um, testing kit yes i i i i have skipped those slides for brevity uh, basically the immunoassay what it does is we all know by now is like the low cost immunoassay it you drop a small sample of blood and it permeates through the immunoassay and that when it touches a particular antibody line and the sample if it has some antigen then it gives a signal a visual signal where basically there are gold nanoparticles which uh, uh, which uh, taints the paper based sample and gives a signal that the it, it might be the blood sample might contain the specific type of antigen which is a signal of the virus and that's how you detect so basically those immunoassays the look the the point of care diagnostic assays they had like a small strip of paper and you put a drop of blood on one end and it permeates to the other end 
and it gives a signal or if it gives a, a case positive signal then you have a, a particular antigen present in the sample and there was a problem with that like the the testing kits needed to be faster in transporting liquid and it if it were to give you multiple test results on a single strip that would enhance the detection or also the efficacy of the detection because for example in this period of dengue when we have a sample of uh, blood we really want to detect not just the, the the parasite the specific parasite we are looking for with the same sample if we can do the detection for five different sample that actually increases the efficacy of diagnosis and that is called multiplexing so if we can do the multiplexing liquid metering on chip merging and mixing that is going to improve the performance of a rapid testing kit and we now have a vague idea somewhat somewhat vague idea about what this point of care diagnostic device would look, look like it should be a small microfluidic disposable chip which can fit on a handheld size device and can give you proper signal for a particular bioanalysis and then these biosensors or rather these microfluidic biosensors can have can be used in a wide variety of applications not just for covid detection not just for dengue detection but um, several other applications are possible for example you can use them as biosensors for field use to detect bio thread bio threat like if there is like uh, a, a biochemical attack or like an anthrax attack etc food and water quality mo can be monitored using these micro scale biosensors you can have forensic detection now forensic detection is basically like when you have a very small amount of dna sample from a crime scene for example you really cannot diagnose much from it <coughs> the dna sample uh, is so minuscule that you don't get enough signal from it so what you do is you multiply or you replicate the dna sample in a um, pcr reactor and then you do an analysis in a large scale reactor but if your reaction or reactor device itself is very small so that the presence or rather analysis of even a single strand dna is possible or a few strands of dna is possible then that gives you faster detection because then you do not have to do the pcr or this polymerase chain reaction by now we all are probably familiar with pcr because the covid test also involved pcr it was a nucleic acid test and what it what pcr does is like the polymerase chain reaction it is basically a process of replicating the dna through a cycles or cycle of high temperature and low temperature and it takes time so a forensic detection would take time in a standard protocol but if you have a miniature device where a only a few strands of dna could be analyzed then whatever you small amount of sample you get from the crime scene you can test it immediately you don't have to go for dna multi replication and wait for one day or for two day to get enough sample so that you can test it in a standard laboratory personalized healthcare what is that we all know that like i mean when whenever we get treated like in a hospital or in a clinic we generally each of us has some some variety of symptoms but the doctors generally give us the same kind of medicine to all of us so it's a generalized medication not a personalized healthcare system but if you remember if you have a family doctor you always prefer to go to him or her because you know that your doctor knows your system better and he tells you that no this kind of drug or medicine is not going to be suitable for you how because he knows your other features now you can know the other features by experience or you can get the other features by 
biochemical mapping of your um, your body parameters through deploying wearable biosensors like if you have if you wear a wristband for 24 hours you probably generate enough signal for the doctors to identify what are your uh, how genetically you are predisposed to certain diseases and what kind of medication is good for you even if you have a common symptom of a particular disease that increases the efficacy of treatment by multiple fold so personalized medication and personalized healthcare kind of leads us to that direction point of care medical diagnostics basically denotes bringing the treatment wherever it is needed you can say it do a treatment uh, that's because like i mean if you are a, a, a diabetic patient if you are if you have heart ailment it's always better to have continuous monitoring and um, online transmission of data of the vital parameters at a regular interval to the clinician and accordingly change the medication so point of care medical diagnostics means like you do something you i mean when you have this home testing kit for covid that was uh, something a very crude form of primitive form of point of care medical diagnostic you can say biochemical microreactors are needed to uh, to to basically uh, perform several sensitive uh, reactions and uh, and and sometimes performing them in a miniaturized reactor helps because then you consume smaller volume of analytes reactors which are expensive another important attribute of uh, miniature devices miniature biosensors is uh, the the field of drug development where you can have you can generate or develop drug and test their biochemical efficacies in a multiplex device <coughs> overall a miniature biosensor which is also known as micro total analysis system will have a basic device which is which must be small it will have a sample intake unit a sample pretreatment section a specific reaction section where you will have a particular uh, mm, where will you will have a particular reaction you, there should be a sensor element which actually detects the presence and once the reaction is over you need to dispense the sample now one important thing or rather why why do we need a miniature sensor for a better diagnosis a, a few important factors are there number one a miniaturized or a microfluidic biosensor will consume very small amount of fluid now what are the fluids generally the fluid is number one the analyte sample for example if you are analyzing the blood sample then you need a small drop of blood if the reaction chamber is small even a small droplet of blood is sufficient you don't need a whole lot of blood sample for the test when you when the when you go to a clinic to draw your blood sample they generally draw you a syringe full of blood and they do several testing but if a drop of blood is good enough for such testing then that is particularly advantageous it is advantageous when you have to do the test maybe five times in a day next is when you do this blood sample test you see that certain test costs very little and some other test cost um, i mean costs much why is the difference well the reagents that are used in some particular tests are expensive and if you are having a microfluidic chip then another advantage lies here that if your reaction container is small then it will consume less amount of reagents so the cost will be less third advantage would be like when you have a very small chamber in that small chamber the reaction 
whatever reaction takes place the response would be faster so you get the signal faster so small requirement of smaller amount of bioanalyte less cost of reagent and faster response are three major attributes or advantages of a microfluidic biosensor another important thing is that if you have a microfluidic sensor which is very small in size building it also requires less material like on a small silicon chip or a plastic chip you can make it and then when the material cost is less you can mass fabricate it those of you who are rather i, I mean senior people you know how expensive computer chips were electronic chips were in our earlier days when we were students and now those cost of those chips have become i mean so inexpensive because of mass amenability of mass production mm -hmm. so microfluidic chip also has that advantage of being mass produced and therefore the cost can be reduced drastically <coughs> so an ideal point of care device we already explained what point of care device is needs to be versatile meaning that if you have a poc device it should be able to diagnose a wider variety of diseases or wider types of reaction which means it should have multiplexing facility it should be acting fast it should be sensitive it should have high throughput and the cost has to be less the fast response is also known as rapid testing kit or rather devices with fast test uh, response is also known as rapid testing kits and this rapid diagnosis has become a very important terminology in today's clinical um, uh, world because we already know a several a very wide variety of tests are routinely done on these rapid platforms for example starting from urine analysis for pregnancy test for blood sugar even for food safety etc and veterinary medicine these are currently being done. and the development is continuous surface microfluidics which is the theme of today's talk is one sub component of microfluidics where in a traditional flow through microfluidics you pass the liquid through a microchannel which is enclosed but in surface microfluidics you basically deposit a liquid on a flat or a curved surface or a porous surface and one side of this surface is open to the atmosphere the kind of devices that you are finding here these are the point of care diagnostic they are all open type devices for example here this is a urine analyzer where you drop uh, put a drop deposit a droplet of urine in a blood sugar test device you put a drop a uh, put a drop of blood at one end of the device so these are all open surface microfluidic platform the surface microfluidic fluidics technology is basically it uh, it relies on like uh, features like droplets and emulsions are handled you can handle miniature jets you can have microfibers on which liquid will permeate or liquid will transport and several different uh, arrangements are possible as we shall see down the line two attributes are important there one is microfluidics and the second component is wettability which actually denotes uh, or rather quantifies the interaction of the solid surface with a liquid and it is possible not just to have tissue engineering food safety and uh, um, this healthcare related uh, um, uh, technology uh, address these technologies through surface microfluidics i will talk a little bit about even applications where we can use this surface microfluidics for energy and water harvesting the key thing here in on surface microfluidics requires 
the knowledge of how to handle liquid using surface tension. Why do we need to handle liquid? Because for testing any biological samples, it is basically a liquid. Mostly it is liquid. <coughs> and we also already have seen the basic um, schematic of a microfluidic device where you need to draw samples in the testing device, have some reaction, send it to the sensing section, and finally dispense the liquid. So handling the liquid in a quantified manner is very important. Now, before we see how we can control these liquid manipulation, it's time for a brief overview of surface tension because I know that uh, many of you are from diverse background and it's good to have a quick brush up of surface tension. This is a, um, this is a field of science, no matter whether we know it or not, nature knows it for a long time and it has been using surface tension to for its survival, be it these water striders, ants, or large trees, which draws the, the nutrients from the earth for more than uh, several, I mean, several tens of meters. We all know that using a vacuum tube, we cannot pull water more than 10 meters in height, but trees can pull the water and the nutrients to a much higher height. So, what is the origin of this surface tension? Any surface produces this surface tension, be it solid, be it liquid. Why does it arise? Well, if we look at any molecule or an or a, or a assembly of molecules in a crystal lattice, uh, the neighbors all interact with this particular molecule. If we are talking about a liquid, a liquid molecule here is attracted equally well by all the molecules in the surrounding. But the molecules that are residing on the surface, which is in contact with a gas, for example, they are pulled by an asymmetric force because we don't have the same molecules on the other side. So what happens? The molecules experience a net force in this direction or we can say at net energy per unit area now whether we talk about energy per unit area which is joule per meter square or unbalanced force per unit length that is newton per meter both are interchangeable joule means newton meter per meter square means newton per meter if you get the unit of surface tension. So the surface tension, which is the force per unit area experienced by this surface as it demarcates a liquid from a gas or a solid from a gas or a solid from a liquid. The origin of surface tension has both the polar interaction and the dispersion interaction. So polar interaction means we all know water has a polar, water is a polar molecule because of the, um, the uh, pull of the electrons towards oxygen in the H2O. It has some electronegative side and electropositive side. So if you take a water molecule here and a water molecule here, they are pulled together by the polar force also. Whereas dispersion means the Van der Waals force, that is another source of force interaction between the liquids in other type of solvents. Like water, oil, they have two different nature of surface tension. One has polar component, the water, the other has a higher component of dispersion interaction. And that is why we see that uh, surfaces that are uh, spreading uh, oil may not spread water, so on and so forth. A few basic terms and definition, surface energy. We already know that the surface energy is also synonymous to, surface energy per unit area is also synonymous to uh, surface tension. We'll, we'll see what contact angle means and a few other things like pressure jump on curved surface and capillary pumping. We all know like whenever we deposit a droplet on a surface, it actually, it, it, it assumes a shape, a hemispherical shape. And uh, there is a, 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 an angle that it subtends, the liquid subtends between the solid and the gas. 
or if there is a film soap film and you put on a ring a soap film and a slider the soap film will pull the slider towards the left the angle which is known as contact angle it varies if you deposit oil on an ordinary glass surface or pdms depending upon the nature of the solid and the liquid we also see if we dip a solid in a liquid the liquid goes up or it moves down for example if it is water and this is glass you will see that the water rises and this is if this is mercury and this is glass you will see that the level i mean it it, it depresses down this type of or if this is water and this is glass it rises and if this is water and this is glass with wax coating it goes down we call this type of surface which is which has an affinity towards the liquid it is called philic if this liquid is water then we use the term hydro so hydrophilic means loving the water hydrophobic means it is repelling water now depending upon the interaction between the liquid and the solid whenever we dispense a liquid i already mentioned that it subtends a contact angle now why do we have this contact angle or what determines the contact angle remember i mentioned that if this is the solid surface this is the liquid and this is the gas and we are looking at this one small component of this droplet this point is known as triple point because not in the sense of thermodynamic triple point but because solid gas and the liquid all meet at this point and this is exactly not a point it is a line along which the three phases actually go now of course there is surface tension between the solid and the gas solid and the liquid and the liquid and the gas we call these surface tensions by fsg flg and fsl of course they will not be equal and they will act along the mating surface so if that happens then you see there is a tug of war between tug of war between these forces and if you try to draw the equilibrium why equilibrium because if the droplet spreads up to this point and it doesn't further spread or doesn't further recoil then there must be equilibrium established by these forces and that gives rise to this equation the net force because of fsg and fsl is balanced by the horizontal component of the surface tension of the liquid with respect to the gas and when we divided by the length we get uh, sigma which is denoting the surface tension and the surface tension of the solid with respect to the gas minus surface tension of the solid with respect to the liquid divided by the surface tension of liquid with respect to the gas here the suffix gas was omitted and this ratio gives you the cosine theta of this contact angle so this contact angle gives us an indication or a measurement of how wettable a surface is <coughs> therefore when the contact angle is less than 20 degree it is highly spreading it is super hydrophilic meaning that the surface tension of the solid is very high or the surface energy of the solid with respect to the gas is very high if the contact angle is between 20 to 90 we call it hydrophilic a hydrophilic or a super hydrophilic means you deposit a droplet it the droplet will have a tendency to spread a little if it is super hydrophilic it spreads widely it sometimes can spread forever whereas if there is a repulsion or rather if the surface energy of the solid is smaller then the contact angle is greater than 90 degree sometimes it can be very high greater than 150 means it is super hydrophobic nature has all sorts of surfaces ranging from super hydrophilic to super hydrophobic and we all know that lotus leaf is a perfect example of a super hydrophobic surface where uh, the a liquid dispensed on it is easily rolling off 
A few engineering surfaces, contact angles of a few common solid liquid pairs. As it's important to note that it's not the so, not just the solid surface which dictates the contact angle. It is the pair or the combination of the solids and the liquid surface. Li liquid. For example, if you are using polystyrene solid and depositing water on it, the contact angle is 86 degree. But if you are depositing water on the glass, the contact angle is 14 degrees. Surely, polystyrene is almost hydrophobic. It's very mildly hydrophilic, less than 90. But water on glass, glass is hydrophilic. If you are using alcohol on an acrylic sheet, the contact angle is zero degree, meaning that you put alcohol on an acrylic sheet, it will keep spreading. <coughs> Wax or paraffin gives you a higher contact angle with water. We all know that uh, you make a surface waxy, it kind of repels water. Apart from this static contact angle, there is also another terminology known as dynamic contact angle. And what is that? If you, for example, have a droplet deposited on a horizontal surface, you will see both sides have equal contact angle. But if you tilt this surface, you will find that the droplet assumes a shape like this. And if you keep tilting, there is one point when the droplet will start to slide down. If you look carefully, you will find that on the advancing side, the contact angle will be higher than the receding side. And this difference of advancing and receding contact angle is known as contact angle hysteresis. This is a very important parameter which dictates how easily a liquid droplet will roll off from a surface. And why is it important? We will learn it later. Apart from that, if there is a carved surface of liquid droplet, we know that the pressure inside the carved liquid droplet is higher than the atmospheric pressure and this is known as Laplace pressure. It is almost similar to the hoop stress and uh, like you can and you can su sustain higher pressure inside a spherical droplet the mm, difference of pressure is dependent on the surface tension here this gamma also denotes the surface tension earlier i used sigma but mm -hmm. they are interchangeably used and this uh, mm, excess pressure the delta p inside a carved liquid droplet will be equal to twice gamma by r it's a very important observation because the excess pressure that we have inside a liquid carved liquid droplet it will be higher if the radius of curvature is smaller so a, a smaller droplet will have a larger pressure inside the liquid might sound surprising but that is the truth the pressure inside a carved surface is in general given by young laplace equation uh, i will skip this for the sake of uh, time but this is a more general equation which actually can be linked to this laplace pressure as i mentioned here sigma is basically the surface tension now the question is how can we change the wettability of a surface I mean is it possible to tailor the wettability of a surface can we make a surface hydrophobic the answer is yes see we all know that if we cover a glass surface with wax we can make it hydrophobic but what is there by making it waxy well uh, generally if we have a material a surface coated with teflon or fluorinated hydrocarbons or silicon or non-polar polymers they have the, they have these molecular structures which do not form a hydrogen bond with water, which means these provide some sterical hindrance to the water surface to touch the, sur the solid surface. And they kind of keep the water suspended on these. And that is why it gives hydrophobicity. Now, along with these, if we can make a surface rough, which means a rough surface with these kind of hydrophobizing coating that becomes super hydrophobic. We all know that lotus leaf not only has a hydrophobic coating on it, but it also has micro nanoscale pore structures or rather fibrous structures on it on which the water droplet remains suspended. Now, how can we 
coat these materials there are several processes like deep or spin coating plasma deposition vapor deposition micro nano texturing sputtering so on and so forth to change the surface structures and the surface morphology and the result will be different types of hydrophobicity for example if you can make a surface rough and coat it with a hydrophobizing agent such that energetically the water droplet remains suspended on these rough structures meaning that there is air in these pockets of the rough structure the surface loves the air over water so much that there is a layer of water remaining inside under such situation the droplet will roll off very easily like you see on the lotus leaf but on the other hand you if your roughness structure is such or the coating material is such that energetically it is more favorable that the liquid impregnates into the crevices or impels into the crevices of the roughness but it gives a high contact angle then you get to see what is known as a rose petal effect we all have seen rose petal photographs with a dew droplet on it if you invert these rose make it upside down even then this droplet will not fall it is a hydrophobic it looks like a hydrophobic surface the contact angle is way more than 90 degree but there is the difference this one has a high contact angle hysteresis so that it doesn't easily roll off but on, on lotus leaf the droplet easily rolls off in the term of terminology of wettability we call it a cassie baxter state of wetting and this as a wenzel state of wetting we can make the surface hydrophilic also for example any high energy surface like steel glass they are hy hydrophilic by nature and then if you roughen it up meaning if you make the surface rough it will become super hydrophilic so there is one thing to note i have a hydrophobic surface i make it rough it becomes super hydrophobic i have a hydrophilic surface i make it rough it becomes super hydrophilic so processes like chemical etching micro patterning sputtering or uv degradation on high energy surfaces like glass metal or cellulosic fiber will give you super hydrophilicity uh, for example uh, <coughs> if you uh, if you for example uh, put a drop of water on a super hydrophilic aluminum surface you can see that the droplet will spread rapidly so it's almost like as if you put some droplet on a blotting paper the water is spreading like that we will see how a super hydrophobic surface also looks so this is what we actually where we digress from we were uh, asking ourselves how to improve the performance of a rapid testing kit by making having a faster liquid transport and other complex microfluidic tasks so liquid sample handling using surface tension that was our objective traditionally liquids can be handled on a surface by several forces for example electro wetting on dielectric is one standard technology where you can alter the contact angle of a liquid droplet on a surface by placing an electrode at the bottom and applying different voltages on different sides of the droplet for example if we are having a droplet sitting on a surface and we know that the wettability of the surface is such that it gets a contact angle theta if you apply a voltage on the droplet there is a phenomenon which is explained by young lipman's law the contact angle decreases if you charge the surface now if you split the electrode into two and charge one side to a voltage the other side is to zero then you have a high contact angle on this side and low contact angle on the charged side if you take a free body diagram of the liquid now there there will be two unequal forces pulling the liquid on the surface and eventually the liquid droplet will move towards the right and that is what is used in a electrowetting on dielectric this is this requires 
Uh, this can attain very specific type of liquid handling on chip, but the problem with that is that you need elaborate arrangement of electrodes underneath the substrate. For example, this is a video that uh, Dr. Richard Fair shared with me for uh, sharing with you, where they have manipulated a droplet from here to here. Again, one droplet is pinched off from here passed over the array of electrode. This is the droplet. You are merging two droplets. So basically, they are playing with the droplets, pinching off some liquid from here and eventually sending it here over this area of electrode. Very nice work, piece of work, but it is an expensive chip. So low-cost diagnostic device doesn't work this way. So these are the drawbacks of e word or electroweighting on dielectric. So the idea was, can we harness the surface tension alone well, we all know that if we dip a liquid in a, cap um, uh, a capillary tube in a liquid, it draws in a liquid. This is known as capillary filling. We can use that. <coughs> we can use capillary filling for these, these type of open surface uh, lateral flow immunoassays, where you put a drop of blood through a porous medium, the blood sample or the urine sample, it goes to the specific zone. This is how the COVID testing kit also worked. The plasma, it permeated through this and the, mm, and the antigen samples, they, if they had the pathogen in it, they would attach to the antibody coated readout lines and they would give particular coloration to this readout line. Now, there are other types of fluid transport. For example, this is a very nice piece of work where people, I mean, this group has deposited uh -huh. two different size droplets on, on, this is a super hydrophobic substrate and they have carved a hydrophilic island here and here, and they connected these two islands through a hydrophilic channel. So what will happen? Because these are hydrophilic, the water will seep and create a film. Now, the funny thing is that what they notice is that if this is this is a larger droplet and you have a smaller droplet, you may have a liquid transport from the smaller droplet to the larger droplet because of the difference of the Laplace pressure. So although intuitively it might appear that the liquid will run down from this side to the smaller droplet by gravity, it is not controlled by gravity alone. The Radius of curvature of the droplet on either side are also important. So this one harnesses the Laplace pressure, while this type of device, they harness the capillary pumping through porous medium. This is a device where people, which, where people use it as a plasma separation device. So this is like a Wattman filter paper and these filter paper is kind of masked by wax so that the filter paper has waxy regions here. So if you drop, deposit a drop of blood, the blood sample, the plasma will not go towards this because the entire paper has now is now soaked with wax. It can only move through this part. And what they have done is that they have put two chemicals beforehand in these chambers so that when you deposit blood sample the blood cells will stick here because they have larger cells but through the small pores the plasma will permeate into these two channels and depending upon the content of this plasma if they react with these um, the the, uh, the detection chemicals they would give some colorimetric signals so that way you can detect the presence of a particular marker in the plasma sample and detect a disease. The same principle is used for detection of biomarkers in saliva. It's particularly important for treating patients who chew tobacco and then they have some uh, cancer uh, markers which are detected if uh, the patient is uh, allowed to spit at one end and by capillary action, the liquid permeates and depending upon the presence of a marker, they give different colorimetric signal and one can uh, 
essentially judge whether the patient is vulnerable to a particular type of cancer. There are other um, fascinating devices like paper-based microdiodes. All it does is like, I mean, here the liquid which is passing through a porous paper sample can move from this region to that region, but the reverse flow is not possible. Or a um, very primitive type of passive capillary pumping for blood and plasma separation where blood is deposited on this end and through a paper-based sample, the plasma permeates through this porous medium, keeping the blood on this side and the plasma on the other side. If you have a particular chemical reagent here, which detects the presence of a pathogen, you put the droplet here and the liquid slowly permeates to the other side and eventually give you a signal and signal in terms of color. And seeing the particular color, you can diagnose whether the plasma has chemical A, B or C in it. Now, as you can see from this diagram itself, it is intuitive that this reaction takes place very slowly. Why? Because if we look at, this is a paper towel or a blotting paper where you deposit a droplet, it permeates very slowly. It's given by Washburn law that the length of this capillary spread X is proportional to the square root of T or rather the spreading velocity is inversely proportional to the spreading distance. So what it means is that you deposit a drop it will spread initially fast, but later on as the time passes, the liquid front travels further and the speed of transmission, it decreases. And that is why the diapers of babies remain wet and they suffer. And that is why these kind of diagnostic devices, they are not fast, they are slow. So our target, first target is to see whether we can have improved these testing devices to have rapid transport. How can we do that? We all know that there are different types of surfaces like super hydrophobic, super hydrophilic, hydrophobic and hydrophobic. So let's put a pair of hydrophobic and hydrophilic surfaces together, meaning that I have a glass slide. I render this part hydrophobic or super hydrophobic and the right hand side super hydrophilic. And if I deposit a droplet at the junction, we will see that the liquid transmits toward the superhydrophilic side by virtue of the unbalanced capillary force. We try to use this not just for these biosensors or the liquid transport on a lab on a chip device, but also for a broader motivation, including enhancing condensation, fog harvesting or water management in fuel cells and not to mention making better diapers. Now, uh, in the, in the uh, point of care diagnostic sites, our objective would be to ge generate a rapid transport, have droplet metering, merging and multi complex transport, droplet splitting and some 3D features available on a paper-based or a flat surface, if we can get those kind of activities. We already know that how different, uh, what is the basic difference between Wenzel and Cassie-Baxter state. So we try to make surface with appropriate roughness so that at some point, the liquid floats on the surface in the Cassie-Baxter mode. And in the other part, the, leak, the solid surface becomes super hydrophilic, that is, they spread very heavily. And what happens when we have a, such a surface? Like here you see a plate which is super hydrophobic on these brighter spots and super hydrophilic on these triangular, a little grayish triangles. You can see very faintly liquid droplets sitting like pearl beads on the super hydrophobic side, almost like they are sitting on lotus leaf because this is super hydrophobic. And when we put a gentle tap on this, we just tap it a little bit, the liquid droplets disappear. Where they go? If we see it under high speed, we will realize that the plate is moved from right to left the droplets, because of inertia, they touch the superhydrophilic tracks 
and they get transported from the th narrower end of these triangular tracks to the wider end. You can see that the liquid is transporting. This is a horizontal substrate. <coughs> and if I look at it once more, look at any liquid droplet. As it touches this, the liquid is transported there. It sloshes a little bit and then look, this is transported from the narrower end to the wider end. The liquid wiggles and gets transported down the line. You can see. So definitely there is some pumping action from the narrower end to the wider end. And when we uh, see that in, in, in uh, individually, we realize that. It was actually earlier uh, diagnosed or detected in a paper in science that when we deposit liquid on channels that are super hydrophilic and we keep pumping liquid on these channels, they kind of bulge out in the middle. And we saw some of those bulges there. We also verified this formation of bulge numerically. But then what happened is that when we developed surfaces which had the black region denotes super hydrophilic and white uh, super hydrophobic and the white region denotes super hydrophilic. We see that <coughs> depositing a liquid droplet on this narrow end gives us a rapid pumping. Look at here, we deposit a droplet by needle on a horizontal surface and the liquid gets continuously pumped from the narrower end to the wider end. This is a high speed image the high speed video whereas in actual speed you can barely see that liquid i mean once it is deposited it is transported very rapidly to the other side why does this happen when we have a liquid droplet dispensed on this track it forms a bulge and this bulge like as uh, we saw it in the last slide the bulge is asymmetric in nature. The footprint on this side and on this side are slightly different. And because of this difference in shape, the Laplace, the curvature of the liquid meniscus on the left hand side is more than the curvature of the liquid meniscus on the right hand side. Curvature is more means radius of curvature is smaller, which means the Laplace pressure here in the liquid is larger than the Laplace pressure on the right hand side. And when the pressure is higher here, the of, uh, obvious outcome is that the liquid will be transported down the line. This is a um, elaborate um, force diagram which shows the unbalanced capillary force in this direction. And that basically is was also experimentally verified. We put a track like this and on a tilted plate so that when we tilted the plate, the droplet neither went up nor went down. So the horizon, the in-plane component of the gravity actually balanced the capillary force. And we, we actually managed to see that this capillary force is the unbalanced capillary force is basically the origin of the transport. <coughs> and with this, we saw that we were able to get a transport speed which was higher than the washburn rate. In this diagram, these dotted lines show the washburn velocity and the velocity that we got was higher. In both the cases, whether we take the, the liquid front or the velocity of the bulge, we had the higher velocity. So the bottom line is that on a rough hydrophilic surface, we were able to uh, on a rough hydrophilic track, which is laid down in a specific form, in the form of a triangle, we were able to get a fast transport. Now, with this fast transport, what we did was on a horizontal surface, we drew three such tracks, a pair of tracks where you see the liquids are transported from right to left because of this unbalanced capillary force, and then they merge and get transported to a third track. The fascinating thing here is that the two liquids merge and jump onto the third track after a given quantum of liquid is transmitted on the previous two tracks and it doesn't flow back. This is a perfect valving and metered dispensing. So you have a definite quanta of liquid going from 
the first two track jumping onto the third track you know i mean as if there is a non return valve so this is important because in chemical diagnosis you have to always dispense a known volume of analyte or the reagent and just by changing the size of these tracks you can determine by what size or in what volume the two liquids will dispense throughout this video which was played in real time you definitely have noticed that there was a one way flow that there was no flow back just by keeping a barrier of super hydrophobic region here between this track c and track a and track b they are all super hydrophilic tracks laid out on a super hydrophobic background by the way here what was the substrate do you know it was an overhead transparency film those again who are old like me must remember that earlier there was no lcd projector or powerpoint presentation we had to present on plastic papers they are known as transparency on an overhead projector so we had a poly pet sheet the overhead transparency sheet and on top of that we deposited a nano composite which was super hydrophobic and we shined uv through a photo mask to render these regions super hydrophilic and that's how we achieved this flow when we see this under high speed imaging this is how the merging happens and then the merged droplets go to the third channel so what we saw in the previous slide real time is what you are seeing in a high speed image this is achieved on a paper based device so this is basically on a paper towel and this device yes. you see yes uh, uh, professor ganguli uh, i'm calling on behalf of the organizers yeah so uh, basically there is a provision uh, of a short um, break of 515 minutes so if you want to avail that we can uh, take the break otherwise depends on the depends on the participant i uh, wrote to uh, obishek that i would prefer to uh, talk i mean at a stretch till 9:30 or so okay i'm uh, uh, sorry 8:30 or so and then we'll engage in discussion okay no problem if you want to continue yeah. we can we can okay, yeah okay, thank you okay so this this uh, uh, arrangement the capillary driven surface micro mixer or this device that you saw it can be used as a good mixer also what we do here is like we put two liquids here both are colorless just to show you the mixing we choose a pair of liquid which when mixes produces dark color so i will just play it once again from the beginning we charge two liquids on the two tracks and then they, we allowed them to coalesce we are playing it at high speed meaning that it is slowed down and you can see that when the two liquids get in touch they would mix the two liquids will mix and this is the mixing is producing the dark color so the video that you that you saw in the previous case where the two liquids are mixing apparently they are coalescing but what you saw in here is basically what is happening within the two droplets the two droplets are pumping into each other so that the liquids which one of which may be your blood sample the other may be the reagent will mix intimately in such a device mixing of the reagent is very important for a proper reaction and this is happening here you cannot have a like in when we want to mix sugar in our tea we have a spoon to stir but here it is a microfluidic device we cannot have a stirrer here we actually use the momentum of the two droplets and the laplace pressure to enhance mixing and we can also do multiplexing we all know what multiplex means we go to a cinema movie theater a multiplex and we can see movie a movie b or movie c but in the in the domain of uh, biosensors multiplexing means you use one blood sample and you do five diagnoses so imagine that you deposit blood on a microfluidic surface microfluidic array like this and you split this droplet into three how is it splitting 
well you have the same tracks the diverging tracks and because of the capillary pumping the droplet is torn apart into three groups or five groups or whatever number of groups you see and at the end of these tracks you can have a specific diagnostic section under high speed imaging you can see how the liquid is spreading or splitting you supply the deposit the droplet and it is being pumped into these uh, individual uh, tracks which can diagnose a particular disease in a real time basis you can develop these surface patterning on flexible substrate this is the transparency and you can have a 3d structure whereas you here what you have is you have two tracks one track goes below the other so you can have complex microfluidic network on flexible substrates and a variety of point of care diagnostic devices now the fluid transport by capillary can not only go on a flat surface like earlier case we were moving liquid on a flat surface but it can go through porous medium and the application is also enormous for example if in the wearable biosensor technology suppose we have like a wristband which actually catches the perspiration the sweat from our hand and it permeates to the outer side where we have a detection device there are examples of fabric based microfluidic chips which works on fabrics so the idea is like you have a fabric make part of it hydrophobic make part of it hydrophilic and you deposit a liquid it can pass through the fabric which means you wear it uh, i mean we, in, on a garment and you have a microfluidic device on the on what you are wearing under this for these type of devices how the fluid is transported <coughs> we use the laplace pressure driven flow how does it take place now imagine that on a surface on a porous surface suppose a paper towel you have uh, you have a piece of paper towel and if you deposit a droplet on a paper towel it will immediately soak but if you make the upper side of the surface super hydrophobic how by depositing a nano composite a, a, a super hydrophobic material on top of it so that you have a rough super hydrophobic structure here the other side you keep it intact and you put a drop of uh, liquid there maybe water here what you will see is that the droplet will remain on top for a while but after a while it will slowly permeate as you can see here the droplet is placed on a super hydrophobic side but slowly it permeates down the line you can see vaguely the shadow of the liquid which was permeating in the underside the funny thing is that if you now flip the paper such that you put the super hydrophilic side on top and super hydrophobic side on the bottom and you deposit the same liquid the liquid will not come out from the other side this is known as fluid diode the the good application of it could be like you can dose drug on a bandage suppose you have a bandage on your wound and you don't want the body fluid to come out but if you apply any medicine on the on the outer side of the bandage it can permeate through so suppose this is the wound side and the outer side is super hydrophobic you put a drop of drug here the drug would permeate to the wound so that every day you don't have to remove the bandage but the body fluid does not come out because it sees the super hydrophilic side inside the body and the fluidic diode prevents the oozing out of plasma and other body liquid to the outside you can cover the outer side of this bandage with some protective coating so that the germs does they do not accumulate on it and just remove this outer cover and put the drug periodically without removing the leucoplast that is going to make the life of for the patient and also the attendant much easier you can have different designs of these drug dosing for example you can 
ensure that suppose this is the wound region and you can make a track on the underside of the um, of the bandage so that you deposit the drug here so as to minimize the chances of infection and the drug would permeate through this how does it permeate now if you put a drop of liquid here what you see is one such bandage this side is hydrophobic you put the drug here and on the underside of the bandage you have a super hydrophilic track laid down here you see the bandage you put the droplet here there is a mirror which gives you the top view and when we play that you see that the liquid it is slowly permeating down it is the top view the liquid is permeating down and accumulating on this side you see this is an isometric view of the piece of the paper i repeat it once again the liquid is dispensed here it permeates down and it transports to the other side you can see that the liquid is accumulating on the underside on the top view you see nothing the liquid is dispensed on the top view it is going to the bottom side of the paper nothing is visible you can see that the very faintly that the liquid is transporting through the underside of this porous medium and that can give you smart bandage during the period of covid there was a big need for mask and we thought that we can use this same fluid diode principle to develop a a, a a mask face mask using common household material so back in april of 2020 we developed this mask and uh, we i mean got it fabricated by local tailors and got it uh, distributed publicly how does how did that work <coughs> it worked on the same principle of liquid diode and capillary pumping but what we did was i will just explain it we we used uh, three layers one was a inner polypropylene layer which is nothing but those uh, polypropylene bags that we get when we buy any stuff in a supermarket the outer polypropylene layer is also made from the same fabric and the intermediate layer was a cellulosic layer which could be made from any uh, any any cotton fabric like the best is if it is an old t-shirt or old vest then that gives you the best super hydrophilic fabric so that, that was the time we tried to develop a face mask from whatever material we have at our home the principle of operation was that inner polypropylene layer inner means this is the side which stays inside the inner polypropylene layer had some it had a hydrophobic nature and it had a poor di dimension as mentioned here you can see these were all homemade experiments you can see my son's uh, plastic scale ruler visible and it was we used a, 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 a household microscope to image because that was a lockdown period but we realized that the cellulosic fiber is which is hydrophilic it had the water absorbing capability while this has this can retain the water using this water diode principle so when a liquid droplet is dispensed on this inner layer it passes slowly through this inner layer but here what happens it spreads on the hydrophilic or super hydrophilic intermediate layer but the combination of the super hydrophilic and the super hydrophobic outer layer gives the same situation of the water diode where you dispense some liquid on the hydrophilic side it does not penetrate to the outer side so what happens when you sneeze the droplet may penetrate this inner layer it can be absorbed it will be absorbed in this intermediate layer and by no means it will go to the outer layer we did a scaling analysis when we have uh, we calculated noting this pore size we calculated the dynamic pressure of the droplet to penetrate this pore dimension and we saw that the penetration happens if the velocity of the droplet is greater than this which in case of uh, our mm, fabric it was greater than 6 0.68 meter per second which is the case when we sneeze 
it goes past this inner layer into the intermediate layer at a velocity of one meter per second or even higher. But when we inhale, the velocity with which the air comes in is less than this. So when you have a floating droplet outside the mask, the liquid droplet will come, but it will remain arrested on the outer layer of the polypropylene. We tested it under, uh, I mean, under spray, and we found that the mask was more effective than a standard surgical, mic uh, surgical mask that was available during April 2020. Remember, at that time, there was a very large scarcity of even surgical masks because the production was not up to the mark at that time. Nobody knew that mask will be needed in such a high quantity. So this mask was widely disseminated. Later, Shulekha actually uh, took the technology from um, Jadavpur and then they, uh, they actually sold it in the initial period of lockdown. Of course, later on, uh, um, more number of masks were available through other technologies and then this mask was no longer needed but in the initial phase uh, this mask did a lot of good thing <coughs> now talk, we talked a little to talk about the healthcare sector but i told you that this surface microfluidic technology also has some Im implications on energy and water We all know that cooling towers are one of the largest source of water loss from the industry. People in Kolaghat, they know it better or anybody, I mean, even in Holdia, you see a large number of uh, uh, industrial plants where cooling towers are deployed. A cooling tower, from the top of the cooling tower, we always see a large plume, which is basically a combination of unevaporated water, vapor, and recondensed fog. Out of these two, the unevaporated water and recondensed fog are basically water, and they do not have any thermodynamic implication. Basically, cooling towers are made for releasing heat to the atmosphere. But we don't want to release water. And if we can capture this water and recycle it, that leads to a good saving. In fact, we uh, did a pilot study in one of the NTPC power plant where we threw in some metal meshes on the cooling tower sail. So on the path of the cooling tower fog, we put some metal meshes and we were able to capture a part of the liquid. And we found that a 500 megawatt unit uh, can have about 10.5 meter cube per hour of water being captured, which is a lot. We found that the Fog harvesting capability of from cooling tower was comparable or even higher than atmospheric fog harvesters that are widely deployed worldwide. But still, these meshes have poor collection efficiencies. Ah. Primarily because when you have a metal mesh deployed in the fog, no. the fog, many of the fog will pass you through the pores. The it will also bypass the mesh. Even if some water droplet is captured on the mesh surface, this is a zoomed in view of the mesh fiber, they will be re-entrained into the, into the flow because of the fluid drag. Sometimes the mesh pore will be flooded or rather clogged. And whenever you have a clogged mesh pore, the fog will no longer pass through this pore, meaning it will bypass the mesh. It will be almost like an impervious plate. And in that case, the fog will not be captured on the mesh. Apart from that, mesh failure, mechanical failure, tearing, that also occurs. So the challenge remains that how can we develop a metal mesh so that it can have a better aerodynamic efficiency so that not much of the flow passes through the pores. The liquid which attaches onto the surface has a high adhesion so that it does not get torn away or rather carried away with the flow along with the flow whenever these liquid droplets accumulate on the surface we want them to easily slide down the mesh and get captured in a particular designated slot where from the water will be collected so it should have a low sliding angle and the mesh has to be durable and getting all these properties on the mesh surface requires some 
intelligent tuning and there we take inspiration from nature in namibia which is one of the most arid place on the earth a particular type of weather condition arises where although this is a highly dry area in every morning fog arises or fog appears from the ocean to the sand and nearly 60 to 200 days in a year there is dense fog on the on the on the desert <coughs> it doesn't matter whether we know it or not but the fog creature the, the desert creatures like this beetle they know that what they do is they go up on the sand dunes and they sit on the fog in this specific position and harvest the fog when their surface is seen under electron microscope we see certain type of roughness and a waxy coating on their surface which means they have some wettability engineering on their surface which allows them to harvest the fog up to 12 percent of their body weight and not only these beetles but also the desert grass they have some specific coating on their leaf surface so that they can collect water which can quench their thirst thirst so we try to engineer the wettability of the fog meshes we aged them in chemicals and to render their surface micro and nano rough it's called hierarchical roughness and then coat them with hydrophobizing elements and hydro and keep them hydrophilic as well and have different surfaces of mesh to test their ability to harvest fog water the water droplet deposition depends on the wettability of the fog uh, wettability of the mesh and we are currently designing a strategy for combining the mesh wettability along with the mesh geometry so that we get the highest aerodynamic efficiency and the highest drainage efficiency to give a very high fog capture i will not go into the details of this analysis but what we are doing is we are analyzing putting in these meshes and see how the seeing how this fog is actually impinging on these on these surfaces so essentially this is uh this is how it looks under uh fog condition so when we deposit this uh, on the mesh you can see under high speed how the fog actually impinges on the mesh and you can see that um, a large fraction of this fog is impinging on the mesh so that the density of the fog down the line is a little less and that's how we are trying to find out the fog capture efficiency apart from fog capture the wettability engineering is also used for enhancing condensation on a surface now whenever we have a surface which is cold like if you have a cold drink on a hot summer day you will see that you keep the container and you will see first tiny bits of droplets appear on the container outer surface of the contain container why because the atmospheric moisture the water vapor it condenses on the surface and after some time you find that this droplet would coalesce and form a layer on this surface so that you get a film this type of condensation is known as dropwise condensation whereas the second type is known as film wise condensation it is seen that dropwise condensation gives you a much higher heat transfer coefficient than the film wise condensation however in reality all surfaces initially though they might give you might give you drop wise condensation eventually they go into film wise condensation and the heat transfer coefficient falls why because the condensation takes place through this cycle initially the vapor is nucleated these nucleated droplets grow because of sustained condensation on this subcooled liquid the droplets would coalesce and then they would form a film if we can somehow get rid of the film from the surface periodically then you can get this cycle repeat 
and you can keep the dropwise condensation sustained on the surface. Now, how can you remove this film? It is about draining the film. How can we make the surface self drying? Well, if we can make the surface hydrophobic, you saw the super hydrophilic aluminum surface and we have modified the same surface with some chemical to make it super hydrophobic. But there is a but. The thing is that a super hydrophobic surface, although it can shed the liquid very easily, there is another bottleneck. There is something known as nucleation thermodynamic barrier. A surface which is super hydrophobic means it does not love water. So the water vapor hates to nucleate on this surface, meaning that the energy barrier is high which means the nucleation rate on a super hydrophobic surface, which will, will be less. This curve shows the nucleation, normalized nucleation rate as a fun function of contact angle. And you can see higher the contact angle as it goes to super hydrophobic regime, contact angle of 180 degree, the nucleation rate drastically drops. So making a surface highly super hydrophobic does not help the situation. You can shed the droplet easily, but the droplets will not form easily on it because it does not love to nucleate on a super hydrophobic surface. So what can we do? Instead of condensing on a homogeneous surface, if we can condense on a patterned wettability surface, what we have here is again those track like features. We have a hydrophilic surface, which is a mirror finish aluminum surface, and this is a super hydrophilic surface. How do we make it super hydrophilic? We take a mirror finish aluminum and etch it with laser. So we have a laser etched super hydrophilic region. Why does etching make it super hydrophilic? We already discussed if you have a hydrophilic surface and you make it rough, it becomes super hydrophilic. So a shiny aluminum surface was etched super hydrophilic. Now, if you have condensation here, the droplet will touch the narrower end of this track and the track will pump the liquid by capillary pumping. Something similar to this, a condensed droplet will touch the narrow end and it will be pumped. We have seen this pumping before. So. What, how, why not we implement it on the surface of the condenser? How do we implement that? This is one such surface where we have the hydrophilic tracks which are darker and the, the super hydrophilic tracks which are darker and hydrophilic mirror finish surface which is giving rise to these droplets. Now, in a regular situation, if this plate were all mirror finish, you would have seen large droplets which would form because of this coalescence of this small condensed droplet. But what is happening here? These tiny tracks, they are draining this condensed droplet repeatedly. As the droplet is growing bigger, it is touching one of these tracks and the track is pumping them, bringing them into these highways. And if you can see at the bottom, the condensate is draining at regular interval from some designated spot. The whole thing led to a rise of condensate heat trans condensation heat transfer between 30 to 35 percent. Now, 30 to 35 percent may not sound a big thing to you, but in energy business, it is a huge number. So we were able to enhance condensation on wettability pattern surface. Not just that, we all know electronic cooling is a big thing now. Cooling of micro, micro electronic chip is highly recommended for data center and high performance computing. And jet impingement cooling is one technology. Those who are working with heat transfer or thermal management of electronic packages, they are familiar with it. But the basic principle is that we know our laptop gets heated and that kills the performance of the laptop. We have heat pipes in our laptop, but in, but in data centers where we have arrays of computer, we need better arrangement of cooling. And people use water jet impinging on the chip or not on the chip on the 
heat spreaders of the chips to wow. cool them. Now, in the jet, jet impingement cooling, one problem is that you really cannot have jet impinging on, often really on the other side of the chip because of the architecture of the chip may block the back side of the chip. So that you have to do some arrangement. You probably can impact the jet at this point, but you want to cool another point, meaning that you have to move the liquid directionally on the chip. So what can you do? We can use these tracks and suppose this is the region you have to cool and but you can impinge the jet not at the back of this particular point but you have to impinge it at a distance. By arranging this channel structure you can have this jet striking here the liquid will be transported to the target region. This is a high speed video and it can it can produce the required cooling by directional transport. This directional transport has another advantage. Suppose you are cooling the, uh, this hotspot by a jet and you are targeting this spot itself by a jet. The liquid in general will spread in all directions. So here the liquid jet, if it hits here, it will go towards right, go towards left, go towards you and away from you. That will require a large amount of water to cool. But here we have a directed transport. The entire liquid is passing over the region that we want to cool. So it is a effective cooling in terms of usage of liquid. What we did here, we actually etch the material metal surface with acid and then treat the surface with fluoroalkyl silane and mm, uh, laser ablet so that we have a super hydrophobic base and a super hydrophilic track and then we impinge the jet and transport the jet through this track and this is the back side is heated and we remove heat from this track this is a thermal image which shows how the liquid actually cools this uh, this device and we have found that the there is better heat transfer and which it's just not not just a single track you can have multiple tracks and cooling of multiple chips using a single jet assembly the beauty here is that suppose this is a, um, a hot location this is another hot spot you can impinge the jet at a location which is away from the hot spot suppose it is available for the liquid impingement but you cannot have a jet impingement here or here because there is another electronic architecture here. This kind of arrangement provides cooling for such assembly. So we saw that both on the energy side and also on the healthcare side, we can do a lot using tunability of the material. I would like to thank my collaborator uh, from the University of Illinois, Chicago, Professor Magaridis, Constantin Magaridis and his team. Uh, a few of my students are also there um, uh, who are collaborating with me and the funding agency is there. And also my team at Jadavpur, Professor Amitabha Dutta, my colleague, who is there, I mean, who is working with me on the condensation and the fog harvesting aspects and several current and former students uh, and also the funding agency, Department of Atomic Energy and ACRB who are funding our research on this wettability engineered surfaces for energy and water harvesting. Finally, I would like once again to thank uh, Holdia Institute of Technology for inviting me and of course all of the participants for joining. Now you can ask questions, so I would minimize the presentation and turn on my video. Uh, we have some time for the discussion. Thank you, Professor Ganguly, for this wonderful lecture. Now the floor no, is open for questions. So, is there if there is any question, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask.
Okay, if there is no further question, then Abhishek. Yes. Uh, Professor Ganguly, I have one question uh, regarding this uh, Namib desert beetle you you, you were mentioning. Yeah. Uh, so in that, I mean, what can be, uh, I mean, it's, it's a large scale application. Well, the large scale application, we basically uh, are trying to uh, functionalize the surface or rather tune the wettability of a fog harvesting mesh so that the water droplets would once they are intercepted by the fog mesh, they would roll down very easily on uh, on uh, on to the collectors. So what happens with the Namib desert beetle is that the water droplet they deposit on the surface and then they trickle down to their mouth and they drink. Okay. Yeah. Basically, they trickle down to their front tentacles and they form large globules of water from where they drink. They bring the tentacles to their mouth and then they drink. So I understand that in, in, in some places where there is water scarcity, so there this can be uh, commercially that is, No, that is, that is for atmospheric water harvesting. But for industries, cooling towers are a big source of water loss and all the cooling towers can be fitted with these fog harvesters to save water. So is there any uh, commercial application right now or it is still in the research phase? It's still in the research phase. Oh, okay. In cooling towers, if, if anybody is working in the power plant, they, they know that in cooling tower currently there is a, a device what is known as a drift eliminator, which is there to capture large droplets. Okay. But once they pass the fan area, then there is drift. And also what happens is that as the water vapor rises in the cooling tower, it recondenses back to fog due, due to cooling. So the target of this fog harvester will be to capture the drift as well as the recondensed fog. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Any other question from the participants? So if there is no question, please uh, um, join me thanking uh, Professor Ganguly uh, for uh, the enlightening lecture. So thank you so much. We are really en enriched uh, um, by this lecture. And I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Atal, uh, AICT Atal for uh, sponsoring us uh, so that we can have a um, uh, in, I mean, exchange of opinion and knowledge to enrich ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Ganguly, it was really uh, a very vivid lecture from right from the basics to the highest level of your research. It Thank really enlightened us on the various aspects of this uh, topic. So it was very interesting and it was really nice hearing from you with all your research work and all the congratulations for the projects that you have received from the national agencies. So it will be of great help when this project finally uh, becomes yes. commercial. We hope so. In nature, yeah. So okay, thank you, thank you for your wishes. Thank you once and again, sir. Good night, everybody. Good night, sir. Namaskar. Yeah.